Okay, welcome to Ostia Boston. Uh, if you're here in person and you're on our Zoom, we want to say you really um, make a big difference uh, in terms of feedback and questions and developing speakers, etc. Really excited, uh, and I want to thank you for that kind of participation. I also want to say if you're watching on YouTube that we're excited you're here and um, you know, we really appreciate your feedback and appreciate the fact that you're listening. So thank you. And if you love it, give us a thumbs up. And if you would like to receive content like this all the time, then please subscribe. So anyway, I'd like to bring um, um, a minute to just say how excited I am tonight to have um, the wonderful speaker that we have that we're going to be interviewing. Um, uh, Dr. Keith McCormick. Um, and um, Keith is uh, a author of a brand new book and, an, and a second book that he had already put out, an Olympic athlete, uh, chiropractic physician, and, um, and many other things. And so I'd like to just say um, he had uh, just a little bit about him from the blurb on his uh, back of his new book which is called Great Bones, Taking Control of Your Osteoporosis. And we're going to do a little bit of an interview with him tonight. So um, he had 12 osteoporotics related fractures in five years. He was, as, an, as I said, an Olympic athlete, um, chiropractic physician. And, uh, and after years of his own research, he knows what potential dangers look for women and men who don't understand the life cycle of bone, who don't realize the role nutrition plays in bone health, and who don't know what can happen to bone even when they think they're doing everything right. And in that mission and with that spirit, um, Dr. McCormick wrote this new book, um, Great Bones, um, Taking Control of Your Osteoporosis. And so let's let's delve into it with him, shall we? And learn more about what he intends with all um, all of this. So we're excited to have you, Dr. McCormick. <laughs> okay, so um, let me just start with um, asking you this because we're pretty excited. I know that I was so impressed with your book, um, and I know that. As a chiropractor, you study bone and muscular health, um, the, the biomechanics as a, as a professional. Um, you talk about starting at 17 as a pentathlon contender for the Olympics. And when you were in the equestrian portion of the uh, Olympic qualification, you took an incredibly bad crash and you broke your back in two places to finish the race to help the team qualify. And then later, after you healed and over the next se several years, you pursued your passion again as uh, a Vietnam vet. You made seven world teams um, and the 76 US Olympic team. Wow. Um, and this as an anticipated performer to bring home the gold in the 1980 trial. But after the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, um, President Jimmy Carter decided we were not to compete in the games that were going to be held in Moscow that year. Wow, what a blow that must have been for you. Um, yes, very much so. It, um, yeah, it was one of those uh, life uh, PTSD <laughs> times when you put everything into it for years and years and years and then you know then it's called off so yeah it was it was a trauma I've, i'm sure um and then you talk about how your world changed completely when you were at the age of 45 years old and you went out for a run and then you experienced severe pain on your hip and then going to a doctor and they discovered micro fractures on your hip and a severe case of osteoporosis, which you describe as the bones of a uh, 90 year old woman. Or well, I, I say that because that's exactly what the, uh, the technician, when I had the bone density said, I, you know, she just blurted that out. Wow, you have worse bones than a 100 year old woman. I was like, oh. 
<laughs> yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> right. Started, I didn't, and it was just uh, yeah, not a very professional thing to say. So. I agree. Did that experience shape you in any way to change the nature of the way that you did your chiropractic work? Sure. I, I didn't know anything about you know, bone metabolism, really. I knew biomechanics and, you know, anatomy and stuff, but nothing about metabolism. And, I, you know, I'm not, it's not that unusual because um, back then, I mean, I went to like the first endocrinologist I went to, he didn't know anything about osteoporosis. And I think a lot of people didn't, you know, it was, it's kind of a new thing on the on the medical scene and i talk about that in the in the book and how you know this is you know at that time we were just really learning about bone metabolism and so yes it completely changed how i um work in my office you know i i didn't do any of that stuff before and uh as soon as i found out about osteoporosis i got very interested in it. Absolutely. Now, did you, did that influence at all? I know that you said at that point you um, had already gone through chiropractic school, but it, did it impact you in any way in the way that you exercised or the, your orientation towards your exercise? Well, at that point I was 45. And so, you know, I wasn't training for the Olympics anymore. I was working and, but I think um, it didn't, you know, at that point, I guess my whole life is run that way. I, you know, whether it's, whether I'm training for the Olympics or whether I'm competing, whether I'm, you know, practicing in my office, I do everything hard. You know, I do everything all out. And whether I write a book on osteoporosis and spend two and a half years and staying up till two o'clock in the morning and getting up at six and writing again, I guess that's just who I am. You know, I, 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 I immerse myself totally and which gets me into trouble. And, um, but I think that's how I get things done also. But, but yes, I think it, it made me, you know, do all those things still, but also, you know, think, okay, well, I do have to do things differently. I do have to eat better and uh, maybe not train as hard um, as I used to train. You know, when you train hard, you're producing a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines and those uh, increase osteoclastic activity. So, you know, I think people don't realize what training hard means, you know, and that doesn't mean training an hour or two or three hours a day. That means training 12 hours a day. And that means, you know, biking six or 700 miles a week, swimming, you know, 30, 40,000, running, 100 miles a week, you know, it's like you're doing all these things, plus you're working, plus you're trying to treat patients, and you're staying up till midnight doing things. That's hard training. So yes, I backed off a lot from that. But it wasn't because of your fear of your bone strength. Yes, it was. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and then uh, you mentioned that there's the three shortcomings in medical approaches um, that you feel that doctors make the mistake of doing, which is they, number one, um, or they don't do rather, wait a minute. Well, the, oh, they don't do is listen really well. Two is prescribe first before getting a full picture. And then the cure, no cure diagnosis leads to hopelessness. And I, I really related to that whole comment because I think a lot of people feel that they're not being listened to sometimes when they're with a variety of doctors. And um, it's the Band-Aid that we feel that leads us to want to do some more research. So do you think that we're on a path to fix this issue? I don't see it happening, but I love it. But yes, I mean, we've all experienced it. Even I've experienced it. You know, I go into the, to my doctor and she doesn't really listen, you know. And, um, you know, when I was just first diagnosed, um, yes, they they have their mission. They have their, their specialty and they don't want to know that, oh, yes, you also have a little bit of tummy pain or that you also have, um, 
you know, sensitive skin or that you also have uh, your hair is a little bit falling out. They just want to know about the bones. You know, they don't want to know about anything else. So, and they only have four minutes. I got to go. So uh, is that changing? I don't, I don't think it is. I wish it was, but that's why I wrote the book. It's one of the reasons why I wrote the book because I want people to understand osteoporosis so that they can talk to their doctor better. And they can say, well, you know, what about these lab tests? What about those lab tests? You know, isn't this symptom kind of related to osteoporosis? Don't you think we should track that down? You know, I had a great uh, endocrinologist in the end. Um, I, I, in the book, I talk about it. I, was, I talking to five different endocrinologists, and I finally found one who did listen. And he didn't really know anything outside of osteoporosis. He didn't really know what to look for, but he was open to letting me explore with lab tests and, and talk about it. And so that was what made him great, you know. Um, and I think that's what's important to understand is even if a person's doctor doesn't know everything about osteoporosis, it's okay if they will work with you, if they will uh, take the time to listen to you and, and, and explore things. But that's where the book comes in. You know, the more you know about this disorder, the more you'll be able to have an open conversation with your physician. It's a conversation we have a lot in this group after our speaker leaves, uh, is being listened to. And so it's, it's so interesting you brought that up. And you also listed seven questions on page 33, in case you you have the book, to ask a healthcare provider prior to making an appointment with them. And I thought those questions were, wow. Um, and I don't wanna go over all of them, but like, for example, um, is it, so I'm a chiropractor and, and uh, oftentimes a medical doctor will say, oh, chiropractors don't know anything, they're terrible and stuff. But if you just ask that, that medical doctor, well, have you ever visited a chiropractic college? They'd say no. Well, have you ever read a chiropractic book? Well, no. Well, have you ever really sat down and talked to a chiropractic physician about chiropractic? And they'd say no. Well, then how can they you know, say chiropractic, it doesn't help. And the same thing here, you know, ask that doctor, you know, do you, uh, do you specialize in osteoporosis? Don't be afraid to ask these questions. And do they go to seminars uh, to find out, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah, they're, they're not, they're not questions that should put that doctor on edge, but I'm sure that it will because doctors have that bit of edge to them, but they are important questions. Yeah, I, I think that's great. I think, you know, it depends on the, the personality sometimes, but. And a lot of endocrinologists, they don't know anything about osteoporosis because they're diabetes osteopor uh, endocrinologists, which is great, they're great at that, but they really don't know the osteoporosis side of it. And they don't even really know yeah. how to look at bone density uh, exam, you know, so. Mm -hmm. That's such a good point. So in the bone biology chapter, I just wanna say, I really enjoyed the explanation you gave of the MALPs or MALPs and their potential for creating bone loss. Um, never heard about that. And you mentioned looking for elevated LDL lipid levels in a common blood testing uh, for LDL production as a potential indicator of high MALP production cell pr um, formation and a larger production of rankle, R-A-N-K-L, leading to osteoporosis. So um, one of the things I was wondering about is, um, did like, uh, is this something that you see regularly? Is, is this an Common oh, or uncommon? Every day. Every day I see it. Every day. Every day. And the reason why is because your bones, your skeleton, is part of your energy system. And okay. the, the MALPs, M-A-L-P-S, those are adipogenic precursor cells. Adipogenic meaning they're precursor cells to fat cells, adipose cells. And um, so... Uh, you can't get into all this because it's a little bit technical, but the book does. But so um, osteoblasts, the cells that build bone, and fat cells, 
the adipocyte cells come from the same mesenchymal stem cell. And so depending on what's going on with the person, actually of stress, um, you know, toxins, whatever, that uh, will push the differentiation of that mesenchymal stem cell more towards a fat cell than towards the osteoblast. And so now the fat builds up in the bone marrow. Mm -hmm. It crowds out the hematopoietic stem cells that build red blood cells. So now we have less ability to have red blood cell counts, uh, red blood cell protection, uh, production. So that person's red blood cell uh, level is usually a four, 3.9, something like that, 3.8. And yes, they may have uh, other issues. They may have iron issues, but if they don't, and it's that low and their LDLs are high. And why, why are the LDLs involved? Well, LDLs are fatty acids and um, the adipocytes, they essentially suck in some of that, uh, those fatty acids and then they, that increases their number. And so the higher your LDLs are, the more available that is, and especially if, if you have oxidative stress, because then that oxidizes that LDL, that increases this thing called PPAR gamma. And PPAR gamma is a transcription factor that pushes that whole system towards the differentiation of the mesenchymal stem cell towards an, a fat cell. And now that person has way more fat in their bone marrow than they should, decreases red blood cells, the LDLs are high, and then we have less osteoblastic activity, which you will see in a P1NP. So, so as you know, I have a whole chapter in there about lab tests. And so I explain all these different lab tests to get in one of the, the, the bone formation markers, the bone formation uh, um, lab test is, is pro-collagen type 1 N-terminal propeptide or P1NP. And I use that much more now than, I, than osteocalcin, which I, I used to use. But um, so anyhow, the, you'll see that that osteocalcin, that, that P1NP level will go down as the osteoblastic activity goes down too. Excellent. Um, oh, but the mocks are- Technical for sure, but very, things. very, uh, very interesting. Um, and I, I was curious about that. Um, and I really loved that this part where you talk about the different kinds of osteoporosis, um, the low bone resorption and the high bone um, turn um, low bone turnover and the high bone turnover, basically. And <clears throat> could you just briefly uh, discuss that with everybody? One of one of my pet peeves is that doctors will have a person come in, their bone density is negative 3.0, and they give them a bisphosphonate or perlia or something, and without doing bone turnover markers. And a lot, I mean, a lot of doctors don't think that bone turnover markers are helpful, but there are two major, there's, there's lots of different reasons for osteoporosis, but when you're talking about just plain primary osteoporosis, you can have a low bone turnover, or you can have a high bone turnover. A low bone turnover is when osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity is really low. And so you'll do a CTX, a C2 peptide on them, and it might be at 200, which is pretty low. Their P1NP, which is the bone formation marker, might be at 20, even at 15. So it's really low bone turnover. There's nothing going on. That bone is, is getting old. Just naturally, that's, that's what's happening in their body. You don't see that as often as high bone turnover. High bone turnover is when those osteoclasts are really ramped up. They're breaking down a lot of bone. And um, that person you know, is high risk for fracture. But if you give that person with a low bone turnover a, a bisphosphonate, that what, what does a bisphosphonate do? It, it kills off or makes the osteoclast sick. Well that's not going to help our case very much. It's not going to really do a lot for that person's bone density. They, their osteoclasts are already very low in activity. So now you're poisoning what you got. Now you're going to not only just bring down that osteoclastic activity, 
but the osteoblastic activity that's barely there to begin with is even going to get lower. So the P1 and P will go lower. So you would never want to give that person the bisphosphonate or, or prolia for that matter. You know, that's, yet, yeah, that's the person so. where you really need to get some anabolic activity in there. You really need to use it, you know, maybe in a negative 3.0, I wouldn't say do a drug, but if they're a negative 4.0, they probably have to do an anabolic like parath parathyroid, uh, parathyroid analog, uh, Forteo or Timlos, or maybe even Evenity. But, you know, using an anti-resorptive for them, you know, wouldn't be my first choice. Okay. Well, that's so interesting. And I, I, I never had it, heard it that way before, although I, of course, there are people have varying uh, results on that drug. And so it certainly would explain why. Um, just that makes a lot of sense. Why do you think there, um, I mean, I guess this is the million dollar question, but why do you think there's such resistance about getting um, the, the TBS scores in the United States right now, the trabecular bone score uh, was tested when they, well, couldn't they do it when they're doing a DEXA scan? Um, oh, I why is there resistance than getting bone turnover markers too? You know, um, yeah. I, I don't think a lot of doctors put a lot of time or effort into the patients with osteoporosis. And um, the TBS is a great test. Uh, the problem is there's not a lot of them in, in Massachusetts or in the United States. I think they're, they're becoming uh, facilities that have TBS capability is becoming more you know, there's more and more. It doesn't cost that much. I think it's between twenty-five and thirty-five thousand dollars for the hospital to, to get the program. It's about seven dollars prescription every uh, seven thousand dollars prescription every year to to maintain it. Um, so it's a it's an it's a great service. It it's vital mm -hmm. in many cases to get a TBS on somebody. If you, for example, if you have a person with diabetes, their bone density may look okay but their bone quality is much worse than, than, than you would expect. So they're going to fracture quicker. So, so one person with diabetes at negative 3.0, it might fracture. Another person without diabetes at negative 3.0 is not going to fracture. So you need to look at that TBS, the trabecular bone score, and that will tell you, okay, this person has okay density, uh, okay quality. You know, maybe it's not, we don't have to shoot for the drugs right away. They're 52 years old. They, um, you know, everything else about them is good. It's only a negative 2.9, negative 3.0. They have great TBS. Uh, they're 115 pounds. So, you know, uh, instead of in 130. So, so, you know, that they probably look a little bit worse than they are on that, on that bone density score. You know, that's the perfect time where you say, okay, let's back off here. There's no reason to do a drug in this case. So it's great for, helping to determine when a medication is important or not. Uh, so interesting. And, you know, um, I know I was personally told that um, by several former endocrinologists that um, I sh don't need any, uh, some of the tests, um, particularly TBS, because it wasn't done at the facility also. But they said, once you are already into osteoporosis from osteopenia, it, there's no more valuable information. And, uh, yeah, it's interesting, but <laughs> these, yeah, anyway, let me, let me go ahead and ask you another question. Um, uh, oh, I'd love you to discuss this. Um, after the, um, when you talked about therapeutic target signs and symptoms and lab tests again, and you talked about the P1NP, the DEXA, the CTX, the 24-hour urine, the vitamin D levels, you talked about therapeutic targets to look at that uh, provide you with information that can be fixed. The first is the white spotting on the fingernails. I never heard that, but you say indicated trace mineral deficiency in zinc, for example. And the other was high sensitivity, high sensitivity C-reactive protein that's measured in a blood test. And would you just discuss those two things a little bit on here? with us, please? When, when I work with a person, you don't want to just have to wait for a bone density two years later 
you want to be able to know that what you're doing is helping. So I look for therapeutic targets for things that are wrong. Uh, they can be signs and signs, symptoms, blood tests, whatever it is, you know, tummy pain, uh, constipation, white spots in fingernails, uh, biomarkers that are off, things that you know you can change. And then you, you start changing those things. And if you change them, you know you're doing something towards the health and hopefully for the bone health. The white spots in your fingernails is uh, often uh, zinc or other trace mineral deficiency. I used to have tons and tons of white spots on my fingernails. Um, uh, and I see that in patients, you get them onto uh, you know, micro minerals and they go away. So, and all those minerals are important for bones, for, for not just for bones, but for overall health. Uh, same thing with uh, C-reactive protein. That's a, that's a uh, protein that's released by the liver. And it's, you see that elevated in cases of uh, inflammation. And they used to just use it for heart, analyzing, uh, assessing people with heart disease, um, their risk factor, but it's also a risk factor for osteoporosis. And the reason why is because the higher inflammation is, the more chance you have of fracturing. So, so if you take a person with like a, if, if, if normal for the, uh, high sensitivity C-reactive protein is a one. If it gets up to three, you have probably two and a half more chance of fracturing. Up to six, and it's up to three or four or five you know, times more of fracturing. So the higher that is, the higher fracture rate it goes. Same with homocysteine. You know, uh, if your homocysteine goes up, and that is a um, it's a metabolite from protein. And when that goes up, it hardens up the, uh, the cross-links in bone collagen fibers, makes the collagen fibers more stiff, less supple, and so your bones get more brittle. Um, homocysteine is also involved in uh, like levels of hydrogen sulfide, and hydrogen sulfide is one of those um, gasotransmitters. Uh, so they uh, like nitrogen oxide, uh, hydrogen sulfide. Those are gases that act as transmitters for, for, um, uh, uh, for sending signals throughout your body. Well, you have low hydrogen sulfide, you're going to have greater risk for fracture. And you can't measure that. You know, I can't measure that. Taking somebody to measure that is very difficult. But you know that probably if they have a high homocysteine, uh, their, their, their hydrogen sulfide levels will probably be off. So if you can decrease their, their homocysteine, you're probably going to impact that, that um, pathway and hopefully improve things. Maybe you might not see it in a CTX coming down, but you're going to see it in other ways. So, But yeah, lots and lots and lots of lab tests to do, and we try and change them. That's really great. I know that um, you divided the book into several different parts, three different parts, actually. Section one, getting people oriented. Section two was like getting yourself familiar with the body mechanics, basically, and the bone mechanics of, of what's going on. And then um, underlying systems that impact bone, I think, was the title of the second part. And that third part was like the future, what the future holds. And then I also like how you had put, um, technically speaking, as a column on many pages to get into things in more detail. And then also the case studies, which I found so interesting. Um, the case studies are, are really cool. And um, can I mention one case study that I yes, love? Please. Um, I mean, I think all the case studies are really interesting. And I think what I tried to do was in my case studies, I didn't try to say, oh, you do this and we're going to fix this. And, you know, I didn't try to, you know, say, you know, what I do is perfect and that I tried to use cases that bring a point that I want to get across. And one of my favorite is um, this woman came in and with back pain, mid, mid thoracic pain, and she had uh, just moved some chairs and 
had this back pain right away. She, I think she came to me like the day after or two days later. It was very soon after. You know, I'm palpating her spine. She, the way she's describing her pain, to me, it was a no-brainer. I've seen so many people with stress, with compression fractures or their spine by now, because I've been working with people for 20 years on this. And it, it wasn't even a question to me. It was a compression fracture. I knew it was a compression fracture. So I said, okay, we got to get pictures of this. We get the pictures. The radiologist report comes back normal. I go, really? No, that doesn't make sense to me. So I say, okay, I got to get the, I got to get those pictures, right? So I, I asked the patient, can you please get me the CD of the pictures? It, it, she brings it in and there T, at T6, exactly where I said, I said, you know, even when I was just examining her, I said, I think you have a compression fracture of T6 and it comes back and there's a compression fracture of T6 and it was only 25%, but it was a compression fracture. There's no doubt about it. So I call up her medical doctor and I say, I need a reread on this, on this because her, her medical doctor was the one who had ordered the, the x-rays. So, and she was a little bit grumpy, I must say. And uh, I had to really talk to her and convince her to, to get a reread on this. Uh, but she's really, she relinquished and she said, okay, I will. So she sent it to the radiologist. The radiologist read it, came back, no fracture. I go, no, it's, it's not, you know, that's a fracture, but he, he would not, get off his, you know, he, he kept saying no fracture. Yeah, yeah. I said, okay. And so, it, so by this time, the patient totally thinks I'm wacko, totally thinks that I'm wrong. I'm a chiropractor. Her medical doctor said, this is not a fracture. Her radiologist, the radiologist said, it's not a fracture. Mm -hmm. I said it was. So she believes the medical doctor and the radiologist. I said, you know, so uh, 10 weeks later, she comes in again. She had just been for her. She didn't do anything really, but she had more intense pain there. I, I examined her. I said, wow, now it looks like that's fractured more. You know, I'm just palpating her. And also there's another one that's probably fractured. So she doesn't believe me at all. So I say, we need x-rays. Well, that x that. T6 was now, you know, really fractured. It had, had gone all the way. Because So now we've wasted 10 weeks of not treating her properly. Yeah. She'd never had a bone density. So we had scheduled her for bone density, but that wasn't for four months down the road. And they weren't going to do anything to help her until we got the bone density. And they didn't even do that until... 10 weeks after her first injury because they didn't believe what I said. But anyhow, the second x-ray showed not, all, not only that T6 had completely fractured, T8 was fractured and T5 were fractured. And, uh, and now she is on her way to what's called a cascade of fractures. And, I, you know, and that's what happens. So now so not just five, not just six, not just five, not but say, but now seven and there's others that are fraction and then and it's because nobody took it seriously and this woman obviously needed a medication at that point she needed medication right. that was just and that did not happen for over a half a year after this right. whole thing started how, how frustrating all right well i i can certainly understand that's quite this yeah um all right i wanted to ask you another question um let me say, but it's not on that part. Let me see. Oh, when you got to the chronic um, inflammation, you talked a lot about inflammation in your book. Um, the immune system, the chronic, um, the prime forces behind osteoporosis being that. You talked a lot about it being a leading cause of people's issues and I wonder what you think and I know you went into diet in here too eventually later on but you, what do you believe that every person could be helped by, by being on a gluten-free diet or even an alkaline diet would you comment on that no um I you know I think 
there's a lot of people that are sensitive to gluten, but there's a lot of people who aren't. And if you don't have to be, I think I mean, gluten-free diet is not the greatest diet in the world. They use a lot of bad things in there <laughs> to take the place of the gluten. Um, so no, I think, you know, I do a lot of testing, of course. So I test for anti-tissue transglutaminase IgA, anti-gliadin antibodies IgG, anti-gliadin antibodies IgA, uh, total IgA, um, endomycelium antibodies. You know, you look for those things. And if they're positive, you pull them off the gluten. If they're negative and they, and they say, doc, every time I eat gluten, I feel terrible, then they're off of gluten too. So it doesn't matter if the test is negative, if they feel something you know, adverse when they eat gluten, then they should become, then they should come off. And I think people don't realize that um, you can lose bone density from gluten in two different ways. I think they, they, they only really see gluten as damaging the villi in the intestine. And so when those villi that, that absorb nutrients are damaged, they're not gonna absorb nutrients. So, but you can have adverse effects from gluten, even without damage to those villi. And uh, oftentimes a, a doctor will only order anti-tissue transglutaminase IgA. And if that's negative, then they don't go any further. Uh, even if the person has GI issues, they don't go further on it. So uh, anti-tissue transglutaminase IgA, so transglutaminase is an enzyme released by the, in, the uh, cells in the gut. And if they're damaged, they release this transglutaminase. Your body produces an antibody against it. We measure it and we say, okay, yeah, they have damage to the villi because the anti-tissue transglutaminase is high. But if, but if they, have, they can also have a sensitivity to gluten that is not enough to damage those villi, but it's enough to cause an antibody response, anti-gliadin antibodies response. Mm -hmm. So if you have an antibody response, you are perking up that immune system. And if you perk up the immune system, you're going to affect all your immune cells. And osteoclasts are a form of a white blood cell. So they are a relative of white blood cells. So every, so they talk the same language as a white blood cell. So every pro-inflammatory cytokine, tumor necrosis factor, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, interleukin-17, all those pro-inflammatory cytokines they hear that noise from those cytokines and they increase their activity level and they break down bone, even without a disruption to the villi in the intestine. So you have to look, so if a person's sensitive to gluten, they need to be off of it. If they're not, then there's no reason to be off of it. So. And of course, you're, you are a very big proponent of a higher al um, alkaline diet. Sure. Yeah. I mean, um, just a 0 .05, 0 0.05 change at the level of the bone will increase osteoclastic activity. So your body has to have, your body stays at, you know, blood, blood level between 7.3, 7.4 pH. If it gets down to 7.2, 7.1, you're in trouble. So your body really tries hard to keep that blood pH normal. So all day long, you, you break down tissues, you break down, you know, your, your organs get, get a little bit damaged, your bones get a little bit damaged. So at night you go to bed and that's why it's so important to sleep well, is uh, then you go into this repair mode and there's a lot of hydrogen ions being produced in that repair mode. Hydrogen ions are acid ions. So they, you need to buffer those hydrogen ions and you typically do that, we do that with breathing because you breathe out carbon dioxide, getting rid of acid, but you also get rid of it by alkaline minerals, potassium, bioorganic sodium, uh, magnesium, and calcium. And uh, you get those from your bones. And so if your body doesn't have these alkaline minerals avail readily available, then you've got to start breaking down bones and it increases osteoclastic activity. So yes, uh, eating more alkaline foods and, you know, is helpful for sure. And, 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 and to sum it up, would you say that most of us need to eat more vegetables and more fruit? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I noticed myself, I have a diet related question for you, is that after exercising a lot, um, 
skiing or hiking, something that really requires a lot of energy. Um, I need to have an, um, my electrolytes recharged. And I, I know that that helps me, like if I have a energy drink or a, a smart water type, for example, not to name a name of the water, but an alkaline, um, not an alkaline, a electrolytic water. Um, and so what, what is your take on, on that? Are we really needing those drinks? And what do you think about them? Yeah, don't get the ones with sugar in them, but, um, but yes, you do. And you need them not only for the trace minerals, but, but for the electrolytes like your son, because as you know, every nerve in your body has to use those electrolytes to, to fire off. Um, uh, you know, blood vessels, you know, the, the inside of the, um, of a, of a blood vessel is, it's called the glycocalyx. And, and that is very sensitive to making sure your electrolytes are, are functioning properly to, to have that glycocalyx work properly. Um, so yes, I mean, energy systems run on electrolytes and how, it, and how that's going to, uh, affect the whole process of, of getting, you know, getting nutrients from, um, from foods. So, yes. Yes. Uh, okay. okay. All right. And, and, and it keeps you, keeps you more alkaline too. Okay. Good to know. Oh, good to know. Um, and I also really enjoyed everything that, uh, you said in the book about diet it was so interesting. Um, especially about protein and how you've addressed that most people, um, should have about 50 to 80 milligrams a day, depending on your size. And you mentioned a speaker we've had in the past, Dr. Bess Dawson Hughes, uh, and her recommendations of uh, one to 1 1.2 kilograms of body weight per day for your body, own body weight to determine that. Um, and I wondered, just out of curiosity, and I bet our uh, group here listening will too, but. Um, because you have osteoporosis, what, what would a daily diet of uh, Dr. McCormick look like? Could you give us an idea of how you try to feed yourself to make yourself more healthful? I have Oreos for breakfast. <laughs> um, so my breakfast, I actually, I would say five mornings a week, I I do a bullet, I one of those bullet blenders, which I could be a salesperson for bullet blenders um, because I just put a big handful of uh, greens in there, you know, chard and kale and spinach. And I put in some flaxseed and I put in uh, maybe a half a carrot. I put in uh, usually a scoop of either amino acids or um, I used to do a lot of whey, but I think that started bothering my tummy. So now I do pea protein, but hemp, Hemp protein is great, uh, but I use pea protein and um, uh, almond milk or you know some something like that, and I blend it up, and there's my breakfast. And it's and it's you know the nice thing about it is if you eat eggs or something heavy, then I can't go for a run. You know this, I drink it down in a half an hour. Ready, I'm I'm ready to go for a run. You know, and I I guess I'm always thinking of what what training thing am I going to go do next. And so, um, so that, that's helpful. But for, for lunch, I might eat sardines, uh, sardine sandwich or something like that. I eat a lot of, I, I eat a lot of soups. And the reason why I eat soups is because then I can dump my collagen in there and bone broth in there. And um, I eat a lot of uh, fish and shrimp and um, can't, I, I don't, I, I, I probably eat red meat maybe once every two months or three months, I don't eat red meat. I don't know. Um, but no, I tried it really hard to get 60 grams, 65 grams, your, your bones are protein. And um, so you can take in all the calcium you want. And if you don't have that protein, uh, you're not going to, you're not going to win the game. So that's so helpful. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I, um, and I, one of my questions that was, how, how do you incorporate more vegetables in your diet? And you just told us <laughs> that's a great solution. The smoothie thing is, is easy and great to use. Yeah. 
I know that salt is often an issue when you brought that up in the book. And um... I think people, you know, they hear it, but they don't think it's that big of a deal, but it is. It's, it really is a huge part of it. And um, I can see that in patients where, and, and you need salt, everybody needs salt. So it, it's a delicate balance between taking it and you know using it, salting your food and not too much. But you can really see it in people who, and, and, and the other thing is like, I have patients that have come in for, for neck pain and, and I said, do you get headaches? And they go, no. And then I adjust them and work on them and their headache goes away and they go, wow, uh, my, my head feels so much better. And I said, but you said you didn't have a headache. It, well, I guess I did because they get used to it. And the same thing with the diet, they get used to salting their food and they don't realize that they're over salting. But, you know, you look at their, their um, sodium level in their, in their comprehensive metabolic profile and you look at their, how much calcium is in their 24 hour urine calcium. And if those are both high, bring their salt down and it can really help. That's really good. Good to know. I appreciate that. Um, also, um, there's aspects in the book um, where, um, oh wait, I think I asked you that already. Uh, I know that this question varies uh, greatly with what type of osteoporosis someone would have and what their underlying issues are, et cetera. But um, your experience with patients is what I'm looking for in this is after um, that come to you after a round of medications um, that were prescribed by their doctors, um, which do you, which medications do you feel are most um, poorly uh, prescribed? This is one of those sad questions. Does it always really, um, you know, I guess I feel for all my patients too much and uh, I see mismanagement all the time. Uh, I had one patient and she was on Forteo for eight years. And I go, <laughs> how can she be on Forteo? For, Forteo had, you know, has a two year black box warning, not anymore, but, but before, you know, you couldn't do it for more than two years, but she was on for eight years and her bone density wasn't improving at all. She was giving herself a shot every day for eight years. And it's like, oh my God, you know, or uh, the number of people I've had who they've been on Forteo or Timlos or Perlia that they weren't backed up with a bisphosphonate and now they've lost everything. Not only did they lose it, but now they're in big trouble. So, um, yeah, I see that all the time. And, and not just that they didn't do what's called sequential therapy. So, so that's sequential therapy. Whenever you do prolia, you have to follow it up with not just a bisphosphonate, but you have to follow it up with reclass. You can't follow it up with, with Fosamax or Actinel because they're not powerful enough. Maybe if the person's only done prolia for one year, possibly two, two years, uh, um, for one injection or possibly two injections, so six months or a year, you can probably get away with Fosamax or Actinel, but maybe not. For sure, not at three injections or four injections, you have to do reclass. So I see that all the time, that they're not given the, the right drug, um, you know, the right sequential drug. But also, as we touched on before, when we talked about um, low bone turnover versus high bone turnover, the person wasn't even given the right drug to start off with. And I think, you know, I'm a chiropractic physician. I can't prescribe drugs, but I can help people understand the different medications and what medication is, is appropriate. And that's what is great about the chapter in my book. I go through all those drugs. And I think by the end of that chapter, a person will be able to go into their medical doctor and say, now, you wanted me to do this, but I don't know. What if, you know, look what this says. Maybe that's not the best drug. And, and there's a delicate balance between not upsetting the doctor, but also having a, a good conversation, too. So. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so important. And, and of course, you mentioned earlier about, you know, there's always that blanket of giving everyone a bisphosphonate to begin with. Um, 
sometimes as a, especially from our PCPs, if someone is uh, newly diagnosed and hasn't been to an endocrinologist, it seems like that's the first line of um, drug and, that people. And not everybody with a negative 3.0 needs a medication. You know, that doesn't, just because they're osteoporotic doesn't mean that they have to take a medication. There's lots of patients that don't. Mm -hmm. It's just, you have to look at that individual person, see what's going on, and then make the decisions. And, and these decisions are flowing. We're, yeah. You know, we're going to change these decisions as we go along. Not, we're not going to get locked into one thing because maybe that thing that we first chose doesn't work. Well, right. we got you know. Right. You know, for example, when you brought up prolia and going on reclast right after that, um, how soon would a patient need to go right on to reclast? Do you, do you see? Um, I go into this incredible depth in the book. And the reason why, because, because that is a very important and complex uh, question. Mm -hmm. So I'll just briefly go over it. Perlia, people have a 210% variability in their response to it. So some people, it works for five months, some six months, some seven months, some eight months, some even nine months. So Perlia is an antibody against Rankle, R-A-N-K-L, and that's receptor activated for nuclear factor kappa B. So that is a direct stimulator of the osteoclast. So when you take Perlia, it's a shot given every six months, that is an antibody. It, it, it essentially stops that rankle from working. But when it wears off, and like I said, it might wear off for five months or six months or seven months. When it wears off, it really wears off. And then the body goes, okay, hey, there's no more antibody. It shoots up the level of rankle. And now we're stimulating the, so it's osteoclast and they are hyper-stimulated. And the longer you're on prolia, the worse, the, the harder it is to get off. And the reason why is because, let's say a person's been on for five years, so they have 10 injections. You form what's called osteomorphs. The osteoclasts don't die. They become flattened and um, dormant. Mm -hmm. They're still alive. And as soon as that prolia wears off, that last one, let's, let's say they went for five years and they've been on it and now they stop and they wanted to do something else. Well, you have built up tremendous amounts of these osteomorphs throughout the years. The, after the first year and a half or two years, there's this amount of osteomorphs. After five years, there's this amount. And after, you know, it just gets more and more. There's little islands of osteomorphs. There's, you know, 15, 20, 25 flattened out, dormant uh, osteomorphs, you know, flattened out osteoclasts that are floating around in the person. So now all these islands of osteomorphs burst forward. These osteoclasts know what the heck they're doing because remember, five years ago, they were real osteoclasts that were actively breaking down bone. So their memory knows, they know what to do. And now all of a sudden they burst forth and they break down tons of bone. So the person goes through a dramatic, what's called a rebound, a dramatic increase in osteoclastic activity and a not just a return of bone density to what it was before, but it's even worse because now we've really started to hurt the bone quality even more. So what do you do? You look at CTX, you look at bone resorption markers, but you can't do it with, you can't know when to do that reclass unless you've done a baseline CTX at the very beginning. So it's when that, when that person comes in, they say, hey, I wanna get off of this. I've been on for five years. I say, well, where's your baseline CTX from five years ago? Oh, I never had one. So we not only never had a baseline CTX, we don't even know if they responded well to, to the prolia or just kind of okay to the prolia. So by doing CTXs before and during and, and during the transition, you can then know when to give that reclass. If they had, let's say we do it correctly. You start off, do a baseline CTX, they, they were 600. We, they, they're on prolia, their CTX goes down to 50. That's a good response. So it's six months after the last um, uh, perlia shot, we do another CTX and it's still 50. Well, it's saying that the perlia is still working. So you wouldn't want to give reclass then because 
it's just going to slough off. You need to have bones that are turn, turning over. They're actively remodeling for a reclass to get sucked into it. So when you're in reclass, getting an infusion of reclass, it's a lot of bisphosphonate going into your body all at once. So if, if that bone isn't turning over, it will just slough off your bone. So it won't, it won't go in. You, so need CTX. you need your CTX needs to go start getting higher, you know, up to 250, 300. So like, then you give the reclass. Okay. But let's say that um, you, you went off the drug uh, or you're still on the drug, excuse me. And you're, you've got your CTX and all of a sudden you, you're, you realize that it's no longer um, this, the CTX score is no longer growing. All right. The bone is no longer growing. How, isn't it too late to do reclast if it like you don't know when it stopped? But I suppose you would know if you did the test every six months that it happened within that six month period. Well, once if if Perlia is working on somebody, it's not going to stop working. It's going to keep working. So so after you know that it's working, so three uh, months after your first Perlia, you don't have to keep testing it. If they're if they're staying on Perlia for five years, which I don't recommend. You don't have to keep testing it because it's going to stay down. Okay. What's important is when you start that transition, that's when you start oh. testing again and you test it every month. Like you tested it five months after the last shot that you've had and then six months and seven months. And as soon as that starts jumping up, the level of CTX jumps up. That's when you do the reclass because then oh. you know that it's going to be absorbed. And then after you do the reclass, three months into it, you do another CTX to make sure the reclass works. Because sometimes the reclass doesn't work because you have too many osteomorphs built up because you've been on it too long, the, on the polio too long. And then what would you do? You ask for another reclass. Okay. All right. Wow. That's a lot of information. That's great. Um, this is so, so, so helpful. Thank you. Um, I think someone asked me the, this question in the interim, but what do you eat for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> we only did breakfast and lunch. I didn't realize that. <laughs> um, oh, I might, uh, you know, like I said, I do shrimp. I do shrimp kind of uh, things all the time. Um, I eat veggie burgers a little bit. Um, I always have soup somewhere, chicken soup or uh, split pea soup or uh, uh, leek soup. Um, um, I don't so know. Do, and do you have broccoli, vegetables not, with it? Lots of veggies. I, I, I'm always eating broccoli or, um, you know, um, some kind of, you know, I don't, I don't like green beans that much, but I eat tons of broccoli, tons of kale, uh, lots of squash, um, lots of asparagus, because I love asparagus, but, you know, veggies. And, and how about any carbs? No, I don't eat that many carbs, which is interesting. You know, I used to, but I honestly don't. I, I mean, I'm gluten-free, um, but I have gluten-free noodles. But boy, I, I don't. I, I made scalloped potatoes the other day, which was very. I was very excited about. I haven't done that for a while. But no, I don't eat many carbs. Interesting. Okay, but would you eat a sandwich, for example, for lunch? Yeah, but my that's what, you know, it's my sardine sandwiches. I eat them all. Oh, the that's time. right. Yeah. Okay, that's good to know. Um, all right, uh, let's see. I loved the final chapters, um, especially the future and how you talk about the AI-guided approach to healthcare. It seems so promising. And uh, being able to determine, you know, a missed fracture, uh, being able to predict when fracture would happen and pinpoint the causes of bone loss, and offer the best options and therapy from, you know, an AI perspective, like not having all the responsibility on uh, our shoulders and reading the book and, and going to someone like you to help us navigate it, but being able to do that in the future and using uh, it to determine which meds would be most effective for a patient, you know, based on what their, all their other issues are. And, you know, you put in the in that aspect better prevention that these are things AI would do 
being able to prevent uh, targeting foods and exercises specifically for you as an individual and enhance senotherapeutics you talked about um, is another thing that tissue rejuvenation to manufacture tissue chips to potentially make new bone that seemed really off the chart exciting and uh, in the gene therapy the, the micro RNA and there's the so RNA. many things that we can do uh, yeah. we're just on the cusp of and my fear is that we'll we'll forget to really analyze that person though you know you know it's like medicine like it, my fear is what happened to, you know, like chiropractic. We touch people. We, we see where that T6 is fractured by touching them. Well, when my patient went to her MD, did, her, did the MD touch her back? No. So, so my fear is that, yes, the AI is going to blossom and stuff, you know, computer-wise, but... We can't forget to touch people and listen to people and, um, you know, and know that they're, they have a heart and that they have feelings. And so I just want to make sure we don't get away from all that. So, so, so good. I mean, I, honestly, I, I can't believe how good AI really is. I, I, I used it to write, like, I love to write. And so I was writing something and I thought, I wonder what an AI would you know, how they would approach this topic. And I just asked the question and they came back with this amazing like answer that was so intelligent and so creative. <laughs> I thought, this is a computer. <laughs> and a friend of mine did that with me the other day, just, just a week ago. And yeah. I said, she said, okay, ask me a question. So yeah. I said, um, so I brought up, I said, is osteoporosis and red blood cell count, the, is the person's uh, bone density T-scores and their red blood cell count related? And, which I just said it was, because it is. His red blood cell count is low, oftentimes, you know. Anyhow, this said, it, it went in this whole thing about just anemia, and it really missed the mark completely. It didn't go into, you know, what I know about it, so. So it has its limitations. It has limitations because I, I noticed that even though the writing was good, I thought, oh, but what about this? So you still need a person to go in and take a look at it. I, I but I did I did love that. Um, but anyway, um, of those three things that I talked about, the better prevention with targeting the foods, the enhanced thenotherapeutics, and the gene therapy, which I mean RNA, you know, if we didn't have that RNA discovery 20 years ago how they can work with it. We never would have come up with a vaccine in a year, but um, let me ask you the, um, the COVID vaccine then. But I'm just wondering of those three, which do you think we're, we would be most likely to, I mean, we're, we all feel like we probably got osteoporosis in the wrong decade, but <laughs> which do you think is the closest um, to, to us achieving? Um, Take a stab at it. You know, I think I think the best we're going to do is assess not 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 through gene therapy. I think that'll help. But I think uh, what we're going to be doing, able to do, is see how a person is doing epigenetically and. Um, just function-wise as far as the cell function goes. So remember I talked about uh, the, um, the inside of a blood vessel, the, the glyco, uh, glycocalyx. We'll be able to look at, so, so your endothelium is the inside of a, of a blood vessel. The glycocalyx is, a, is, is all glyco meaning glucose, there's 19 glucose sugars that that form different structures in this in this area, and and blood vessel health is really huge part of 
overall health. It's cardiovascular health, and there's a lot of blood vessels going to your bones. So it, for us to know what that endothelial glycocalyx health is will be a big deal. And that is biomarkers. So if that was one of your, if that was, was that your first one, I can't remember, but it's, it's the improvement in biomarkers and looking and because there's different metabolites and different uh, sheddings of, of these um, proteoglycans that we're going to be able to find new, there's already some out there, but new uh, therapeutic targets to look at and analyze, and it's called, um, it, it, uh, like a, 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 I think it's called a fluid biopsy. Uh, you look at the, the, the blood and, and you assess uh, these more therapeutic targets than what we're having now. But we're gonna get better at that and we plug them into a computer and it's gonna come out and say, okay, you really need to improve your nitric oxide or something, you know, so. Right. Wow. Okay. So that's... I don't know if I answered that question, but to me, that's the, the better therapeutic targets, I think is what I should say. So. That would be great, wouldn't it? Um, you know, your, your final word in the appendix, I thought was phenomenal. I wanted to read that first. <laughs> I bet everybody who starts your book will feel that way. So of course I did read it first and I read it later, but, um, you mentioned 10 steps to great bones, to having great bone. And it's so rich. Um, and I, I don't want to say them right now because it's, you know, it's spilling the beans. But, um, you know, I think that it's so important, I think, for us to know all the things that we can be proactive about. One of the things that I wanted to ask you is, I know you had written the whole body approach to osteoporosis 10 years ago, maybe? Is that 12 years ago. 12 years ago. Um, what was the biggest impetus? What was the biggest motivation for you in writing this new book? Besides the fact that everybody kept saying to me, isn't this old material now? Which it isn't actually, <laughs> you know, it's just that I've expanded on it. And I, I, uh, I didn't go into the drugs as much as I did in this time. I didn't go into the lab test that, as much as I did this time. So I've just expanded everything, but everything in the old book, you know, it's, it's all still relevant. It's just, there's more to it. But I actually started off, the book's actually, it's, the book is 714 pages, okay? It actually started off 950 pages. <laughs> and everybody that I talked to said, oh, Keith, you can't do this to people. This is terrible, you know? <laughs> you can make this into two books. And because what I was trying to do was make a book for the layperson and for the doctor together. And boy, and that is hard to do. And because I don't want to lose the layperson because that's who's near and dear to me, the, the patient. You know, I want them to understand this, but I also want to change the world and the way that, that doctors look at osteoporosis. I want them to take it seriously. I want to take their patient seriously. And I want the patient to have doctors that they can talk to and they can be on their team. And, they, and so I'm hoping patients will, I mean, it's a delicate subject to say to your doctor, here, read this, you know, they're not going to want to read it, but I'm hoping some of them will. And I'm sure uh, some of them will, I'm so, sure. I mean, you already have had a few of them. Um, yes, we have. I've had some great, I mean, you there are, a lot of, you know, medical doctors that are on board. It's just, we need to get more of them on board. That's know? so true. I mean, you have a lot of endorsements from very esteemed I people on really, this. really, really, really kind, nice endocrinologist, right? Right, nose blurbs at the beginning. And, um, but those, uh, those doctors, I think are a little bit uh, rare. And, uh, but I happen to know a lot of them that are, that are really uh, interested in, branching out a little bit and seeing, you know, branching out of their comfort zone. And uh, so hopefully the book will help them branch out a little bit more. I, that's, that's, that would be wonderful. Okay, I'm going to, if you don't mind, 
taking a little more time, um, I'd love to uh, address a couple of questions that came up in the chat. Um, first, I want to say how much I've enjoyed this conversation and it's, it's in the, and this book. So I did want to show it one more time because, of course, it's got all my <laughs> my dog ear notes, but you don't have to. Uh, you have to see um, Keith on the back as a athlete, as a triathlete. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, oh, this is an excellent question. Um, how does one know how much impact exercise uh, is too much? Good question, yeah. Um, I doubt if any of my patients have ever come in and had too much exercise. Um, you know, I think if you're, you know, if you're probably running 130 mile weeks, then that's probably too much. Um, if you're, uh, you know, and even if you go out and, and um, yeah, I mean, you know, an hour, two hours, even three hours a day is not too much, I don't think. But, you know, so I'll just tell us a really quick story. Um, so I, this was happened to me about 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I decided that I'm going to, with, with some of my patients, I'm going to uh, give them an exercise routine, right? So it, my first customer was this 75-year-old guy, and he seemed fit, he seemed athletic. And I take him, I have this exercise room in my, in my clinic. I take him back there and I'm starting to give him these exercises. I'm trying to develop a plan with him. 10 minutes into it, he's laying on the ground. I think he's dead, you know? And I'm thinking, and I just exercised 10 minutes with the guy. You know, it's like, that's what I, I do that in my sleep. And um, so I, I learned my lesson. That was my last patient, <laughs> patient I did an exercise program with. He didn't die, thank goodness. But I, I realized that my thought on exercise and other people's thought of exercise are different. And so I do think that, um, and they are finding out that people who do, you know, long distance runners, they aren't the healthiest sometimes. And because they, they do build up, you know, lots of pro-inflammatory cytokines in themselves, they, and they probably aren't eating as well as they should. So uh, yeah, if, I think if, if you exercise an hour or two hours a day, that's fine. And, and probably most people aren't going to do that. And that's not too much exercise. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And um, you know, do bring up strength training and weight training. I do strength training. Everybody has to do strength training, not just machines, but uh, you know, dumbbells and you know, free weights are really, really good to have. And why do we exercise? You're not exercise. If you're 70 years old, you're not ex exercising to build bone. You're exercising to stay strong, to make sure you, you know, so you're agile, so you're coordinated. So if you do fall, and you're going to fall less if you're strong, but if you do fall, you'll be able to be more graceful and catch yourself. But you don't say, okay, if I do 60 pounds uh, you know, squat versus 40 pounds squat, I'm going to build more bone. That you, that's probably not going to happen. As you get older, the mechanics transduction, the ability for the transduction of mechanical signals to biochemical signals decreases. So, you know, if you're 30, 40, 50, 55 years old, yeah, the more weight you put in, the probably the more you're going to do. But there, after a while, then you're just increasing your your chances of a, of a fracture. So, so don't go hog wild and say, I'm just going to put more and more weight on and that's going to help. It, it's probably not just putting you more at risk. I appreciate that. Um, let me see. Uh, I think I've asked you everyone's um, questions here. Um, yeah, I think I have. Um, but I want to say, is there anything else that you would like to add? I've been asking you a lot of questions. Did you want to say or make a statement yourself or something you'd want everyone to know about you or the book? Not me, no. <laughs> uh, but about bones, yes. And I think, I think the takeaway is your bones are part of an energy system. Your bones are a very important part of regulating energy. 
And they're not just these structures in your body that don't have you know, anything except attachments to, to you know, muscle attachments, ligament attachments. They help us, they're, they're just intricately involved in, in all of our you know, energy regulation. And because of that, you know, your weight is really important. Uh, your uh, ability to absorb nutrients is really, really important, not just to build bone, but to have a, a steady glucose level in your body, to have that, what's, remember that glycome, that, that area of glucose around, that, that glycocalyx, around in our blood vessels is also on bone cells. So you, you know, and I'm sure most people listening are not cookie monsters and they're not eating lots of, you know, high fructose corn syrup, which is great because that's terrible for you. Uh, but, you know, high carbohydrates isn't a great thing to do. That is going to increase, um, you know, advanced glycated end products, which is uh, really poor for your glycocalyx. So, so trying to maintain uh, good glucose control is a really important part of, of bone health. So. That's wonderful. Um, I think that's great. And um, can I just say, um, is there any other resources you'd like to mention that you think are important for us to draw from in either exercise or nutrition, any other like guru that you think is an important person to follow or, or a group or an online training resource that you think is important from your perspective? Um, Irma Jennings is great. She does a lot of cooking, a lot of, lot of um, meals that are really, I mean, she's this, you know, great cook that I'm not a very good cook. As you can see, I eat sardine sandwiches and that's about the extent of it for me, but she makes eating a little bit more fun. Uh, so she's great. I think um, Margaret Martin up in Canada is great for uh, people with exercise programs. And, and people are always asking me, um, uh, you know, what exercise program should I do? And I'd say, well, you know, tap into Margaret Martin. She's, she's great at that stuff. We also have Joanne Fagerstrom here, by the way, and she's amazing. Do, do you know her? Are you familiar with Joanne? No. I don't oh, know. you have to look her up. Uh, she's Our Strong Bones or something, I think is her website. Um, I hope I'm not misrepresenting it, but just Joanne, I'll send to everybody if you want. She's also great. And we've had Sarah Meeks on here too. And there's plenty of people that to follow if you like to, but I mean, I think it's good to tap into someone and stick to something. It is. Um, you know. but, um, yeah, but you have to feel it and you have to make sure that that person is, uh, doesn't have their agenda. They have you as their agenda. You know? Yes. So you, you, the patient are the most important and uh, it doesn't, you know, you, you, the patient are the final say, you know, I can tell you everything, in, you know, about bones, but if it doesn't sit right, then that's okay. You know, I'm still on your team, you know, and that's the way this doctor or PT or naturopath or whatever, they should be on your, your team, no matter what, because you're the boss is what I, what I self, tell people to do. So important. So good. Well, thank you. I am just thrilled to have had you on tonight and uh, we're excited about the book. Uh, by the way, it can be purchased on Amazon, everybody, if you're looking uh, on YouTube and you didn't get my... And, and if you wouldn't mind doing a, a, a uh, review or whatever they do, when if anybody buys a book okay. from Amazon, if you can put that review in there, that'd be great. Absolutely. I'm thank sure you. we're very grateful to hear from you tonight. Uh, Thanks for inviting me.